ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Satuvanska's family are from Finland in Scandinavia. But Satu's early life was spent in Japan, where her parents were Christian missionaries. Satu was raised with the Lutheran love of serious music and hard work. But when she was presented with her first violin as a little girl, the hard work wasn't a problem. She was fascinated by the junior-sized instrument and persisted with it through all those years of making screechy noises with the instrument. Today, Satu is the principal violinist with the world-renowned Australian Chamber Orchestra. She's lived in Australia for two decades now. and She loves it here, and she's even learnt to surf. On stage, Satu has an enigmatic and slightly ethereal presence, and critics say that her playing can touch a kind of perfection. But to get from there to here meant a painful but liberating break from her old life. Hello, Satu. Hello, Richard. That little bit of music at the start there, that was you playing a really lovely piece by Izay in your home. It was recorded by your husband, Richard Tonietti. That was during the COVID period, wasn't it? What was that like for you as a musician? Oh, wow. The whole world came down in one day and all performances were cancelled. And then we were sitting there, what do we do now? And, well, thanks to the internet, we were then forced to create a lot of content and in the lack of performances, we then recorded and filmed and recorded more and filmed more and created these little vignettes that we could stay in touch with our audiences. And by the counts of what our audiences have told us later on, that, uh, that they were very welcome and I'm sure it helped us survive that very difficult period. There's something really lovely about hearing something as exquisite as that in a really domestic setting. Your house looks kind of amazing. What can you, how, how would you describe the house you live in with Richard? <laughs> so it's an old Masonic temple. We bought this dilapidated big building by the beach some 10 years ago. And it was back in the day when nobody wanted a house on the beach. I don't know why. <laughs> but we did it up very carefully and and it was perfect for us because we could also use it for work purposes as in recording and it's got beautiful timber everywhere so it has a nice acoustic for acoustic instruments especially so we can work and live there. Like I said at the outset your earliest years were spent in Japan. What part of Japan are we talking about? So I was born on the smallest main island called Shikoku, a small town called Tokushima and uh, my parents had moved to Japan in the early 70s with two children in tow and the three others who were born in Japan, me included. And when I was three years old, we moved to a town called Otsu, which is in uh, Shiga, um, Shigaken, which is close to Kyoto. That's where I spent most of my childhood. That's where I learned to play the violin. That's where I went to school, to the Finnish missionary school. <laughs> There's a fish, Finnish missionary school in Japan? Yes, there was in the <laughs> 80s. There mm. were so many missionary families in Japan at that time that all us Finnish kids went to this boarding school. What was the landscape like? What do you remember of that? Oh, it's mountainous, very green. If you've been to Japan, you know it's extremely green. There is a beautiful lake, big lake, the Biwa Lake, just next to the town of Otsu. The rice fields and small towns, very narrow streets. And we'd play in the neighbourhood with the children from the neighbourhood. I'd be, you know, running around with my brother. We'd be getting into all kind of mischief. We'd be catching frogs. We'd be doing all those kinds of things that kids do in Japan, I suppose, playing in the ditches, then going to neighbourhoods, kids' place, and who had a Super Mario, and we'd be playing that. <laughs> for a few hours till our parents would come and drag us out. What did your parents tell you about the decision they made to become missionaries? They must have been quite morally serious and quite committed. Yeah, I think, I don't know if there was a decision as such. I think it was the times. So missionaries were, I suppose, sort of the Christian hippies. So they're people who found, you know, this new spiritual awakening in the 60s and Christian people then often they became missionaries. 
And my parents found that, well, in Japan, there's only 1% of Christians, Christianity and Christians. So therefore they thought, well, that's a country where there's a lot of souls to be saved. They weren't so passionate about going to a place like Africa where you become like an aid worker. They thought that it's just as important to go to a country where you need to save souls. But having said that, in the 80s, 70s and 80s and, and earlier too, Japan was very welcome for missionaries because Japan has a lack of social provider for the country. The state doesn't provide social services. And a lot of these churches and missionaries filled that void. And so missionaries looked after the, the so to say, the outcast of the society, people whose lives have gone wrong in some ways. There's a lot of colorful stories, for example, of people who've been kicked out of a Yakuza. There would be people coming to our church who were missing a little finger and they can't get a job anywhere. They, they've been shunned from the greater society and the churches were the only places where they could go to. So amongst the fact that they were there to convert people, they were also looking after people. Christianity never really took off in Japan, did it? It's one of those implants that never really took off. Like classical music is huge in Japan, but not Christianity. Is there any theory on that? Yes, because Japanese people are not very religious. They are people who use religion for, they use it for just circumstances. They they very polyamorous with their religions. You can be a Buddhist, you can be Shinto, you use religion for whatever circumstance that you need it for. So Christianity was useful because if you wanted to get married in a church, you could then use Christianity for that. But for a Japanese person to commit to one religion and to follow through with that one religion and really dedicate yourself for that one thing is, I think, quite a foreign thought. It's culturally a foreign thought for them. So how much of a curiosity were your parents despite all this lovely work they were doing with the community? We were the only foreigner family in that part of town, but there were the Mormons there too. They were Jehovah's Witnesses. There were some other foreigners too, but yes, we were a curiosity, definitely. And I sometimes think that some of these ladies who came to our church, they probably came to look at my father because they'd never seen a foreign blonde male before. Very handsome. <laughs> I, I suppose for, to them he must have been. <laughs> How much of the home life routine was bound up in the church and the faith and the Bible? Oh, 90%. Church was at home. It was our one of our, it was the tatami room, was the church. And oh, oh, you lived in the church, yes. so to speak. The tatami room was yes. the church. Yeah. And our home was, uh, it was a revolving door of people coming in and out. My mother would have cooking classes for Japanese ladies, English classes. She'd be teaching them English through Bible, of course. And we'd be, every day we'd have a, mornings would start with, a, you know, prayer and Bible reading. And you don't even question it. It's a part of the whole life. Lutheranism is very big on promoting uh, values of like hard work, anti-materialism, sort of moral seriousness. Was that inculcated with you? Were you given that very strongly as a kid? Well, yes. And especially when you don't have very much, then it's uh, useful not to be <laughs> very materialistic, isn't it? <laughs> it's okay. No toys, but it's okay because we're anti-materialists. Well, yes. Mm-hmm. And in my parents' case, they promoted for them, music was very important. They both came from musical families. And for them, it was a very conscious decision that they'd give us religion and they'd give us music. And that was on the cost of there's no ski trips or there's no uh, amusement parks. And I'm very thankful for that because we were given the delayed gratification (laughs) instead of the instant lolly that would come with those thrills of the fun. But there's, you know, time to do those fun things later in life. Do you remember picking up a violin for the first time in Japan? Yes, it was a Christmas when well, it would have been 83, Christmas 83. And how old were you? I was three and a half and um, I, wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to play a Christmas tune because I, you know, as a child you think that you can do it immediately and I picked the violin and tried to play it and of course nothing came out but the total screech. And how, how unhappy were you about that? Oh, well, of course I had a tantrum, <laughs> as you'd expect. But my parents said, okay, we're going to give you a violin because that's what I've been asking for for 
ever since I'd seen one of my cousin, which visited Finland very briefly when I was a toddler. And I and my cousin had a violin and, and I got an obsession about it. And I, I kept on telling to my parents, I want a violin, I want a violin. And then when I got it, they said, well, you've got to practice every day. We're not giving it to you just for nothing, you know. <laughs> and imagine saying that to a three-year-old, you know. It, <laughs> but it... It it worked and I, I kind of understood it because to learn an instrument like a violin, it's not important how much you do it every day, but you must do it every day because it's an instrument that goes into your physicality. We grew up in a time before you could spend your youth doom scrolling through Instagram and Twitter. Whenever I found a musical instrument, any kind of, I was kind of all over it and, and would sort of just be all over it for hours and hours mm. till I could get it to make some kind of noise that I like. Were you like that with the violin or for all in musical instruments? Well, I was so young that hours and hours, not at that age, maybe, you know, you'd play for 10 minutes, but just the connection with the instrument. And now it's been proven what it does to a child's brain and the concentration that is there and the, and the feeling of gratification that you're doing it yourself. You know, nobody else is doing it for you. you you're making it all yourself. It's, it's, it's very gratifying. But hours and hours, yeah, later on then when I was, you know, could play the piano a bit and was doing it just for fun and singing songs and all, you know, at that time passes, you know, and you you just been there singing and playing the piano and chords and going through the songbook and oops, two hours just went there. That was the doom scrolling of the <laughs> 80s and 90s. <laughs> Do you remember the first time you performed as a musician? Actually, probably not even because I was so young. It would have been when I was four, I did my first public outing at the, my violin teacher had a little concert for the students. That's adorable. It would have been very adorable. Yes. Me in the middle of all the Japanese kids. And, and I remember I played Beethoven's Ode to Joy and the Japanese song called Kojo no Tsuki, which is uh, something about um, the moon. And uh, it was just the bee's knees. I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> Have you ever lost that sense of joy and pleasure from public performance of music? There are days, of course, when you are performing about 100 days uh, or 100 nights a year, you get a little tired. You don't always feel like getting on stage. You know, you, you sometimes you're like, oh, do I have to do it again? I don't know how I'm going to do it, do it today because I'm feeling tired. I'm, you know, so many other things going on and I've done three other performances in a consecutive past night. So this fourth or fifth performance is going to be a bit of a chore. But once you get there, you know, you, you get through it and the elevation, you survived again. That feeling is great. Did you grow up with a whole lot of Lutheran church music, like hymns as well? Yes. So J.S. Bach, of course. I'm very lucky to have born into a Lutheran family because J.S. Bach is, of course, the, you know, the greatest Lutheran of all, uh, among with Martin Luther himself. And how lucky am I? Because that is a gift to have access to that music from an early age. But yes, of course, also the old Lutheran hymns from the all the German Lutheran hymns. And we were also singing a lot of those hymns in, in Japanese, of course. So it's a funny combination. And we also had Anglican hymns in the Japanese church book. We also had even Sibelius's Finlandia was translated into Japanese. They turned it into some kind of a religious song. And so it was a real mix of composers and music. And then you left Japan to go to Finland, which was the home of your parents' birth, but not yours. How strange was that for you? Did it feel like you were coming home or did it feel like you were going somewhere strange? It felt like going somewhere very strange. So in Japan, I grew up being a foreigner, of course, but... As a child, you don't look at yourself as a foreigner. I spoke, I played the same games as the Japanese children. I, I had Japanese friends. I did, but you were, you were very aware of being a foreigner because you looked so different. Then moving to Finland, of course, was the opposite. You look like everybody else, but you feel very different because also we spoke Finnish very well. And I, I, I was speaking Finnish very, very well. My parents made sure and the school made sure that we learned it properly. But it was almost too proper. So when you go to a Finnish school that is in an area where people speak a certain uh, dialect and you speaking your very clear, you know, almost like a written Finnish and you you sound like a weirdo, you know, with these <laughs> other kids. Yes, I, I did feel very much like a foreigner in Finland. And in a way that 
sense of foreignness in Finland never left me, even though I did integrate eventually. Did you feel like you were impersonating a Finnish person, even though you looked like a Finnish person, while you were in Finland? Part of me, perhaps, yeah. But I wasn't really the sort of person who could pretend. But but I was probably a way to animate it and polite to be an average Finnish <laughs> child or Finnish person. Being in that situation where you suddenly feel strangely alienated, do you think that helps you grow, have, it forces you to grow up a bit quickly, doesn't it? You sort of have to figure out who you are at quite an early age. Yes, yeah. And you feel like childhood, oh, what a chore, what a bore having to grow through, you know, grow through this, go through these children teasing you. It feels so boring. It's Were just you bored they, by childhood? Yeah, being like, they, they don't know. They don't know. They don't know what life in Japan is like, and I can't explain it to them because they'll just be jealous and annoyed with me. So I just have to bite my tongue and be here and be, you know, teased by them. And part of me, of course, is hurt by it, but other part is like, oh, this is such a yawn. I can't wait to be an adult. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things the Japanese are very proud of, although it's not in any way an achievement, but the Japanese are very proud that in Japan they have four seasons, four proper and distinct seasons. Yes. How different was it living through the long winter oh. of Finland? Wow that nothing prepares you for that darkness. It is, so it was a shock. It's a seven month winter and we, winters are real there. They're cold, but it's the darkness that gets you. And because- well, The sun comes up at about 10 o'clock in the morning or something. Yeah, sun comes up between November and January. Sun comes up at about 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning, goes down at Two three p.m. and I remember when I was about eleven years old, it was in the news that we saw the sun for the first time in a month. So it went through the whole month without some light would come, but of course it's always cloudy and overcast. So yes, it's it's very very dark. I've lived through an Icelandic winter. That's and, exotic, though. Uh, yeah, it's exotic. It's, it's kind of <laughs> fabulous. There's a in the northern part of Iceland, in Isafjorda, around there. They have a ceremony. Yeah. At, at the point where the sun can get over the cliff of the fjord, the, for the first time of the year, the sun yes. strikes the corner of a building, oh. and the whole town has a little party like that. That's awesome. I've been to the north of Norway, where they have a similar thing. I haven't been there at that time of the year, but people really celebrate that when it's been a couple of months. Was the faith not so much in the forefront of family life once you were in Finland and no longer, your parents were no longer acting as missionaries? Did it sort of start to slip into the background in family life? Not at all. It actually became stronger because my parents stayed in a church and they were living a very much like the missionary lifestyle, <laughs> but in Finland. And of course, the contrast then came even stronger because, because even though... <laughs> In Japan, they were converting people, but in Finland, it was only religious people. So only people that my parents knew, the family knew, everybody was religious. And yet we were in this Finnish country that's meant to be a state church and all this. And then there's all this outside world of people who are not religious. So they couldn't convert them anymore like they were in Japan. But they therefore you become a bit isolated. So you start living in this religious community only. And... And that can be quite challenging dealing, especially while I was starting to go through my puberty and looking outside of, you know, the family life and starting to question things. So it did start to become a little bit repressive at times. And what were you reading that was slightly, <laughs> slowly tugging you away from the Lutheran faith of your childhood? <laughs> yes, my mother was absolutely shocked to find books by Bertrand Russell. How and old were you when you were reading Bertrand Russell? 13. <laughs> you total nerd. I, I was a total nerd. Reading Bertrand Russell at the age of 13. <laughs> I didn't right. understand probably right. much, but it, there was a tone there that was so consoling <laughs> and lovely that, that said that it's okay to live without a God. And it was so something that I needed to hear. And I got, at that age, I also got very interested in philosophy and the Greek, ancient Greek and all these things. And you just, you're just opening up your eyes like, wow, there's all this history and world out there that and, I was denied. And what did your mum say when she found you sneak reading Bertrand Russell? <laughs> <laughs> she, said, she came and talked to me very seriously and she said something like, you know, these people might be very clever, <laughs> but dot, dot, dot. 
and I can't remember, but it's something like you shouldn't right. be. And, and was that drawing you away from the faith and into the secular world? Yes, it was. And music was a big part of it too because music is free. Music has so many, there is no boundaries and there's so much history. So it, music was my gateway drug to all these ideas of freedom and, and philosophy and history and, and science even, you know, questioning evolution and the creation theory and all these kinds of things. So, Because that's interesting because sometimes music draws people into the faith, like the music of Bach and Handel is very religious. Yes, and I love that. I love the aesthetic real religiosity of it and I love the philosophy behind that religiosity and I love the a seriousity of the music of Bach and I totally understand the tone, the, the cultural tone of the Lutheranism in it. And I love that, but uh, it doesn't mean that you have to take Jesus in your heart and believe that everybody else goes to hell who don't, you know. So with these terrible pagan thoughts in your head, did you dare speak them out loud when you're at the age of 13 reading Bertrand Russell? Yes, I did some of it, but I was shunned quite quickly and I was also... Um, it's sort of like a denial. My parents didn't want to hear about it. Oh, it's just a phase you were going through. Maybe. It's a phase you're going yeah. through. You're a teenager. You're rebellious. I mean, I was also rebellious. I mean, I was, you know, going out and 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 finding boys and 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 having friends who were not Christian. I mean, that was I was going to the movies, you know, secretly doing all kinds of things that you're not meant to do when you're from a religious family. So they just put it into the compartment of she's just going through a thing and she'll come back to this, you know, she'll come to her senses. And my mother, you always used to say, have you forgotten everything that we've taught you as a child? And I felt sorry for her because she really believed that if you teach a child enough these things, that they will follow through. Once your eyes have opened, they can't be shut again. Did mm. they, were they worried and did they say that they were worried that you might be going to hell? Absolutely. I was told many times that I'm going to go to hell which is not a nice thing to hear, but I understand that it came from a place of genuine worry for them. And for me, it was just, again, a little bit annoying and and suppressive because it's like you can't argue with people. You can't uh, logically, you know, try to argue your case with people who are never going to change their minds. Was this break something you felt you had to do, obviously, but was it still overladen with guilt and shame? Because it so often is with people who have to break. Oh, of course, of course. And that guilt and shame you have to deal with by yourself and go through it. You know, it's a big journey. It took me about a decade to get through this whole thing because it's like... It, it really is like if you're leaving a religious family and imagine so the, all the six other people in your family, okay, my younger sister was too young to be counted in, but everybody is religious. Everybody around your family life is religious. Your parents are expecting you to be religious. They actually don't even want to hear that you're not. And then you alone decide that you're not. It's really like jumping off a cliff and your life shatters and, and you have to build yourself up inside by yourself again. <laughs> have you and your parents been able to repair your relationship since that time? Yes, yes. I'm very happy about that. I, I made the decision of taking distance, which was difficult, but I, I, for me it was the, I think... To me, it was the only way that I could find my sanity. Uh, so I moved to Germany when I was 18, partly also because I just needed to be by myself and not have much contact with my parents. And some of that distance healed healed many, many things. And when I got back, they realized that when I got back to them and, and we were in touch again, um, they realized that I'd actually grown up and my life had not gone to hell, even though I might go to hell once I die, but I'm doing quite all right. And we sort of quietly agreed that it's better to have a relationship and find common ground rather than argue about the things that we disagree on. I know people who, and interviewed people who, had to leave the Mormon church in their teenage years because mm. they discovered they were gay and that was completely mm. unacceptable to the church. Mm. As they got older, they really missed the church though. They mm. really missed the warmth and security and the 
despite the lack of acceptance, mm. there was still a lot of kindness there. Yes. And they missed that and still felt torn and, and, and furious that they couldn't be accepted at the same time. Yes. Not quite the same thing I know for you, but do you still miss that kind of community, that strong feeling of just the small kindnesses that happen within a community yeah. like that? I understand very much that sentiment. Though for me, when I was a teenager, I was almost hoping that my parents would say, we're going to disown you. We don't want you as our, my, as our daughter. We want you to get out. You wanted that to happen. I wanted that because it would have been easier than them saying, oh, we love you so much. You need to convert. You know, we love, you know, so they were giving through their love. They were really, really trying to get me back to the church and it was relentless. So I was, you know, I mean, I was a teenager again, so it's quite a sort of a extreme thing to wish for. But that's why I had to make the break myself because they couldn't. Maybe the fact that they didn't kick you out made it in the long run easy to repair. Absolutely, it? absolutely. And therefore, I, and it made it much easier for both parties to forgive each other. Podcast and broadcast. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler. Find more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app. So you said you moved to Germany. How old were you when you moved to Germany and away from your family? Uh, I was 18. So I moved, I'd already lived in Helsinki by myself for about a year. I moved out of home when I was 17. And was your violin your ticket out? Yes, yes. So all, throughout all those years when I, was, uh, when I wasn't allowed to express my non-religiosity or I wasn't allowed to do many things and I was feeling quite lonely in the family home, so... It was easy way, lock the room, practice the violin. That was, that was my world. Could you find some kind of authentic part of yourself there? I'm, I'm saying this because I, I'm really fascinated by Shostakovich, the Russian composer, mm. because he was in and out of favour with mm-hmm. Stalin. And he, you can hear in his music, well, it's, it's all abstract, of course. Music mm. is so abstract. I can absolutely hear him writing the horror of mm. what it was like to be in Stalinist Russia into his music of that time. Is there something strange about music that allows you to be authentic in a very abstract way that maybe yes. only even you can hear? Yes, and especially with Shostakovich, that could have been the soundtrack to my teenage years. Yeah. Soldiers Safe. bleeding in the snow, <laughs> tanks rattling into St. <laughs> Petersburg, that sort of thing. Yeah, not, not quite so uh, bombastic <laughs> perhaps, but, but yes, this music is the thing because it's aesthetic, it's abstract. So it gives you that wonderful outlet. Why do you think it was a way out for you into another world? How do you think that did that? Do you remember how you felt and thought as you were playing? It was being part of something greater than yourself, you know, and you're part of, you you have reference points to history. You have aesthetic reference points, you know. It's like that moment when you are, uh, you mentioned Shostakovich, and it's also that moment as a teenager when you discover, well, like Bertrand Russell, but it's that when you discover Kafka, you discover Mahler, and it's like this tsunami of, like, I've, I've never known that these things are in the world, and, and you decide then and there, I, I want these things to be the important parts in my life. So you went to Germany. What was in Germany for you? I got accepted to a violin class by this uh, wonderful teacher called Anna Chumachenko. And this was in the mid-90s. Yeah, I went there to study. I didn't speak German. I'd been learning it at school a bit. And my German teacher basically told me that you're never going to learn German because I wasn't a very good student. And and to be clear, (laughs) Finnish has got nothing in common with German, really, does it? Nothing at all. So in my book of languages, German and English, very similar uh, Finnish, Japanese, totally different, but, and they're sort of in a different uh, category. All different categories yeah. as well. What was she like as a teacher with you? Oh, she was a wonderful, very, very strict. She was at the time one of the most famous teachers in the world who had a, definitely a very famous class. Many of my 
classmates were already had a you know flourishing solo career, but she was a very nurturing, uh, very caring, and she certainly understood all the complexities that was going on in my own private life also. And I'm forever very thankful. In fact, my teacher in Finland also was, he was a male who passed away a couple of years ago. And same thing with him. He was a very, very aware what was going on in my life, but without ever talking about it, it was nice to have those kinds of violin teachers because you do spend a lot of time with your teacher. So if Anna Chimachinko yes. was strict and demanding, what did she ask of you? Oh, you'd have to prepare a new Paganini caprice each week to a lesson, which means that you'll be practicing your your fingers blue. What, did she demand your soul is what I'm asking? Did she demand your total kind never. of dedication? Uh, God, no, never. She she was a person who led me artistically, musically. She never uh, she never really commented or, or demanded me to be doing things musically the way she wanted me to do. She would guide me towards things. But no, strict is a very, uh, very sort of a complicated word. You can be strict and loving and giving people, you know, the thing that you need in order order to get the technical abilities so that you can express yourself. And that's what a good violin teacher does. So you were frightened of disappointing her? Of course. Oh my God, getting on a lesson with her. I mean, it's a, a, you don't want to, you don't want to disappoint her, you know, Uh, Behind that sort of lovingness and kindness, you knew that there is a very stern, tough woman there. So how tough were those years of instruction then? Because you're in Germany, you don't speak the language, you've got a teacher who's got wonderful expectations of you, you're trying to fulfil. How tough was that period for you? It was tough, but it was also really liberating because I was out of Finland, I was living that international life that I always wanted to. I was amongst other foreigners. It was at the time when the Serbian war had just finished. And, you know, in the 90s, a lot of the Eastern Bloc students were coming to Germany. My friends were, you know, Serbian, Croatian, Israelis, Japanese, you name it. And we were all speaking German together, which I learned after a year or so. And... It, it was just so liberating. I wasn't the only foreigner in a room like how I felt in Finland often. What kind of work were you doing to support yourself? <laughs> well, I, I was doing everything. And of course, you know, the usual... In Munich, there was a big film business. So we would, you know, go to the studio, record uh, film music. We'd be doing all kinds of gigs as I, I'd be <laughs> playing one day saying, oh, we've got a gig at the stadium said, what is it? I don't even know, but they're paying 400 euros for the day and you have to be there at 11 o'clock. And we turn up and, and put, put a, like a black dress and something on and then they come, comes out. It was Michael Jackson and Friends <laughs> concert. <laughs> so we had a lot of, lot of fun. So, and, so hang on, you're playing in a stadium as, as a, part of an orchestra supporting Michael Jackson. Yeah. And what did they just put the score in front of you that day? That's well, it. Look. It would be a no surprise to anyone. It was just playback. We just pretend to play. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> We're there for the cameras. I am so naive. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. No, nobody. I don't think anybody there was performing live to a <laughs> full stadium. So you're playing the string section to Billie Jean. Yeah. But you're not playing like anything. That, no. You're just there for the costume. Yeah. But well, why do they need you? A real. Oh, I suppose you have to really do look like you're yeah. playing, though. That's the Everybody thing. Everybody has to. And we did really play. It's just that there's no microphone, so we can't, right. we can't hear. So we'd make these kind of pranks, <laughs> often on television, too. Like we'd do these pranks that at really soft spots, we'd like pretend to play really loudly. And at loud <laughs> spots, we'd be like pretending to play really softly. It was like, oh. So if we look at the footage, we get, gee, they're having a good time, aren't they? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Isn't that marvelous? <laughs> So how did you come to hear about the auditions for the Australian Chamber Orchestra? So towards the end of my years in in Munich, I graduated, I'd been living there for a while and it was a time to, the pressure was on that I'd have to get a job in a German orchestra, which I did not want to do. Uh, I felt like I'd had enough experience of that in order not to want, I wanted a bit more an adventure. I wanted to be part of a smaller group. I wanted something a bit more 21st century. And um, a friend of mine called Dejan Lazic, who's a pianist, he's also performed in um, Australia a couple of times. 
he said to me, you know, I went to Australia. I played with this group called ACO. They're amazing. If they ever have a job, you'd be perfect. And so a couple of months later, I was somewhere, found a, found a site, said that ACO is looking for this job called, um, it was called assistant leader back then. And I just sent a tape. That's what we did. And then they accept me, accepted my tape. And then ACO was, was on tour in Europe a few months later. And that's when I auditioned for them. And how did the audition go? Well, it was very short. I, I played, my pianist didn't turn up. I took a train to a town called Bregenz, which is in the border of Switzerland, Austria, France, um, Germany, one of those border towns. And it, I took a train, played my thing, and I didn't think I'd never done a professional audition before. So I don't know if I was prepared, probably not very well. Because I was just thinking, oh, it's Australia. I'll, I'll, I'll try this on. I'm not really sure how this is going to go. And then the next day, they very kindly passed me, probably undeservedly, but <laughs> they called me and said, would you like to come to Australia in uh, late January? And what did you make of that offer? Well, this was in October in Europe and knowing what January is and February is and March is are in Europe, I was like, yeah, I'll go to Australia, get some sunshine. <laughs> and what did you make of Australia once you finally arrived here? Look, it was a sunny day with the big blue skies when I arrived. I mean, what's there not to love? I mean, I was I was completely I think I was high from vitamin D for the first <laughs> first week alone. I was just walking around and I, I I just thought what a beautiful place and 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 I went to I remember walking to Chinatown. Oh, and there's all this great Asian food. Great. I love this because obviously because I had Grown up in Asia, for me, that was such a relief. Oh, we can, I can get all those Japanese things here that I could never get in Europe. And I just thought it was really exotic and beautiful. And then the orchestra was like such a high level of rehearsals. We're actually talking about music and everyone's playing so well and so well in tune. And I was just, this is, this is a dream. expect different things from an organisation like the ACO in Australia than they would for audiences for chamber orchestras in Europe? Well, we don't get any government funding or we get very little. I shouldn't say we don't get any, we get very little. So most of our income comes from performing and private donors. So that means that we have to sell tickets, which means that we have to programme it so that, that it's attractive for audiences. And it's a real balancing act of being so-called accessible but also challenging at the same time. And I think ACO has really cultivated this type of programming where we can really challenge the perceptions of a, what the chamber orchestra is, but also we can play something like Mozart symphonies and, and Haydn symphonies in a way that is perhaps not expected how an Australian orchestra could play them. And, and in fact, that's how ACO made their reputation in Europe, by playing this Viennese repertoire. I saw you play a little while back and I think they all came to see you doing Schubert's Trout. You know, that was, oh, the, yeah. that was the attraction. But afterwards, I think people really liked what you played before that, which was a piece by Darius Millard and the Finnish composer who happened to be in town. Everyone, oh, that was actually the good bit, that bit. Is that, your, yeah. is that your sneaky strategy to bring in people to see what they think they're going to like and then show them something that they might not have heard before that they might like more in the long run? You've cracked the nut. You've cracked the nut, Richard. Yes, that's, <laughs> I suppose that's what, we, that's what we do. That is what we do partly and it is that people come and hear something and they end up liking something that they didn't expect liking. Yes, very much so. Tell me about the feeling of playing in a chamber orchestra. How much of a single organism are you in that sort of larger group? Hmm. 
So ACO is a full-time orchestra. So most European chamber orchestras are, you know, people are casuals. They get together a couple of times a year and so on. So we play all the time together. Oh, and most chamber orchestras in Europe, like just people yes. from larger orchestras that just come together yes. occasionally. Yes, and they're, they're couple, but they're not full-time. Most, most orchestras around the world, ECO is in that sense really, really unique. So that makes it possible that ACO really becomes like this amplified string quartet. It's a, stri- it's a big string quartet of 17 people with a bass. And that means that we play so much together that we really can play with our eyes closed and we can somehow tell what the other person is going to be doing. Now, can you reach that stage of wordless communication, which happens after you've been playing with people for a while? Yes, yes. And we do that on stage. That's what happens. And it's, it's magic. It really is. It's ESP and it only comes from doing it a lot. Even when you're yeah. talking, you go, can we do this? And, they, and before you even finish this, go, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Yes. That kind of thing. Yeah, that does happen. Yeah. <laughs> How about your relationship to your instrument, to your violin? How connected are you to the violin you play? So I'm playing on a Stradivarius violin that was purchased by the Instrument Fund. Uh, you, you are? Instrument. You're playing on a Stradivarius? Yes, I am. How, how lucky am I? You know, somebody, if somebody had told me in the small town of Lahti when I was growing up at, in, in the 90s in Finland that I'm going to be in Australia playing on a Stradivarius violin and, and, and traveling, I would have been, I would have not believed them. It's, it's, a, it's a great relationship, you know. It's maybe the best relationship you'll ever have is, is the one with your instrument because it's a collaboration. So the instrument itself actually tells you how to play it. And what do you mean? So because the instrument has its own character, so you can't just enforce something on an instrument that the instrument doesn't do. So they, it's like, a, I suppose they use the analogy of having a, a Ferrari car or formula drivers. They have those kinds of relationships to their cars. And it's a similar thing. Do you mean like it's got certain tones or textures that are stronger in some places but not so strong in others? Yes, exactly. And you know what are its fortes and you know how to use your fingers, what kind of minimal movements that we do with our fingers but make a very distinctive difference to the sound and what kind of things that particular instrument responds to well. And do you own that Stradivarius? Of course not. Of course not. The ACO Instrument Fund owns it. Right, is it sort of buried in a crypt five miles under the earth when you're not kind playing of, it pretty yes, much? Right? pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Music is the most mysterious of all the arts, in, I think it's fair to say. You can say of a novel, well, this novel's about this, or mm. sometimes with a painting you can say, you might be able to say, oh, it's about that. But music is so abstract and still so weirdly moving. Is that worth pondering or is it, do you just enjoy the mystery of that? It's enjoying the mystery of it is a big part why you love it so much. But then it, it's also a language and it has so much in it. Like you could spend your whole life, lifetime of going through great music. You, you mention, mentioned uh, Darius Mio and then Olli Mustonen, the piece that we played by him. I mean, along with that era music of Darius Mio and all those French composers, and we don't hear that music much. And yet you can throw through it and, and have a very satisfying life, you know, going, and then you can go to Schubert and then you can go to J.S., back to J.S. Bach, then you can go to Nirvana. And you, there's just so much that, that it keeps your whole life very occupied. You're now married to Richard Tonietti, the artistic director, and you started surfing in Australia as well. I, I've seen Richard describe you as easily the best Finnish violinist surfer in Sydney. How did that happen? How did you start surfing? So... Part of it when I came to Australia was, well, I'm going to do something that you can only do here because why would I try to simulate a European life in, in, in Sydney? I mean, what's the point of that? I'll do something that, is, that you can only do in Sydney. And it probably is the only city in the world where you can be a concert level violinist and a surfer at the same time. There's no other city where you can do that, where you can have a surf in the morning and have a concert in the opera house on the same afternoon. And I just loved the, well, I loved the challenge, but I also just loved the feeling of 
learning to surf and even as, as frustrating as it is to try to learn something as an adult that makes you feel like an absolute child. Yeah. It's so humiliating. I was going to say, like, the bit of music I played at the start, that's from a video that you can see on, on YouTube of you performing in your house and watching you physically. You're so physically assured. How, do you, how hard is it to go from that to being an awkward surfer right at the outset? Well, it's kind of fun. On a good day, it's fun. And on a bad day, it's humiliating. On a, and I say it's fun because you know how it is with people who are really good at something, like surfing, you know, people who are amazing surfers. I'm not never going to be that g- great surfer, you know, like those pros and all. Because I'm a professional violinist, I know what it takes to become physically totally, you know, fluid with, with something. And therefore, I, I'm just happy to take the minimal, you know, skill of that where I can just have fun you know, with something rather than turning it into a, something where you have to be perfect or, or not that there is such a thing as perfection, but but it was just liberating to be like a child, learn something like a child again. And what was it like to have your first experience of being dumped by a wave? You know the thing where you yeah. sort of get speared pretty much head into the sand, oh. um, you tumble over, you don't know where up is anymore and you get yes. up in this sand and all these embarrassing parts of your, your, your bathing suit. Has that <laughs> happened to you? Yes, it has. <laughs> Yes, that's happened to me. Yeah. yeah, it's that feeling of when you are somewhere <laughs> like Bell's Beach or I stupidly once battled out at Margaret River and and when you see the when you see the sets coming and you just start paddling out as hard as you can so you don't get and still you can't make it and then you get taken by the Yeah, it's it's thrilling. Let's put it that way. It's more scary than it's almost more scary than getting on stage in the opera house. You and, you and Richard, you're both musicians, you're both violinists and you're both surfers. How similarly do you look at the world? Good question. Probably in some ways we look similarly and other ways quite, quite differently too. But he's also someone who had to grow up very young. So Richard moved out of home pretty much when he was 11 and... Uh, or 12 and for music. And so we have a very similar, that kind of experience of growing up, having to grow up very young and and becoming independent very young and having independent sort of musical ideas. So that very much is, is, is quite similar in that sense that we both sort of feel very strongly about the state of, you know, the... the uh, how would you say, the traditional classical music world that we don't feel like we're very much part of and, and we've always felt that way. Is it hard to come together when you've both grown up to be so independent? No, no. It's very nice to be together with someone who you, who you can also let go of and, uh, and when you know that they can actually survive without you also, you know, it's, it's, it's very nice because then you can, you can have a friendship. How different are you as violinists though? Well... We are very different in that sense that our physicalities are very different. First of all, Richard is a male, his arms are longer, his his hands work very differently. And violin is a very physical instrument, so we we do sort of play it differently. But having said that, we've played together for 20 years. So, of course, there is a way of playing that we we get used to that somehow blends together. You lost your faith in religion at a, at a young age. Uh, do you think you found some kind of a, is faith the right word for it, in other things like music and surfing and marriage mm. and things like that? Mm. Marriage? Mm. Interesting. That I never thought as a thing of faith. But um, music, yes. Arts, all these things like surfing, uh, art, music, philosophy, all these wonderful things that I suppose my parents would have called the gifts from heaven, all the non-material things. I, I, and I love those things. And I think it's a whole life that you can fill with all these, these wonderful things. But I never, I never felt like I need to turn my lack of Christianity into some more trendier religion or something a bit more current or, or let's become now a new age or I found spirituality somewhere else. In fact, I don't even understand when people say, oh, this person is such a spiritual person. I don't know, what does it mean? I mean, we, we all have a spirit that we can practice, we practice every day in our, in our ways. And I think music and nature and arts give you an unbelievable 
reference and 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 the and the feeds that spirit spiritual soul that we all have. It's been wonderful speaking with you, Satu, and thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. Satu Vanska, principal violinist with the ACO, will be touring with the ACO in May this year, performing Mahler's Song of the Earth. to a podcast of Conversations with Richard Feidler. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website abc.net.au slash conversations. You love good, deep conversations, right? Let me tell you about my podcast. I'm Fran Kelly and I'm fascinated with friendship and the people we come to think of as our chosen family. I'll be having some long and very personal conversations with pairs of friends within the queer community. Join me as I talk to Narelda Jacobs, Courtney Act, Josh Thomas, Danny Laidley, Ida Buttrose and more. Just search for Yours Queerly, hit that little plus sign and follow along in the ABC Listen app.